Nolan. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Bill Hochberger, I'm a longtime member of the International Hydrofoil Society. Welcome to this session of the IHS 50th Anniversary Conference and Celebration. Our first speaker today is Gustav Hasselskog, who is the founder and CEO of Candela Speedboat. He's a mechanical engineer with a background as CEO of several big Swedish companies. He founded Candela in 2014. And after five years of R&D, they launched the Candela 7, world's first electric hydrofoil, which is now in serial production in which he will describe. And uh, he'll also explain why hydrofoils are the only way forward for electric boats, which is of course a, um, a message uh, for which he'll find a very receptive audience here. Um, Gustav. Thank you. Thank you a lot for that kind of introduction. And um, to start to say, it's an honor to, to uh, see you guys. I'm, I'm fairly new into the whole uh, Hudderfall community. And um, I've got a great deal of help from, from some of you guys. I, I uh, very early on bought a book from uh, Ray. Um, I think it's kind of standard literature if you get into this industry. I've got uh, quite some help from... Um, from Tom Spear as well in various forums. All the help I've gotten from from uh, from some of you guys uh, in the uh, in different forums and, and in direct contacts and in book form and all of that. So so again, uh, a warm thank you. So um, let me try to share my screen then. Um, do you see anything? Yes. yes. Excellent. Yeah. Good. So I thought I might start in this way by going back in sort of the history of, uh, of boating or uh, of the uh, naval industry. And I think uh, um, this is probably the best boat still around. It's a displacement boat. Um, as you know, it's super efficient. And if you go slow, um, you need almost no energy at all. So um, that's still sort of the best thing we have. And, and uh, as you know, all the big uh, tankers of the world, they are still using this principle. But you run into some problems with the with the Frode number um, as you go a bit smaller, as we are doing. And I think the next step, really, in the uh, in the uh, development of uh, boating is probably this with the invention of the combustion engine, uh, and that allows for using a lot of power to push uh, something forward, which is not super efficient. Although uh, this design is probably the most efficient you can do when it comes to planing boats. No V hull here. Uh, which increases efficiency may make that whole construction a bit bumpy, but otherwise I think it's a it's a pretty good one, right? And and but if you look into this boat, and and we're going to continue to discuss that a bit uh, throughout this presentation. But I think the core problem with it is really the the resistance, and uh, compared to uh, if you look if you express it in 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 friction and friction coefficient, you end up with something like 0.2 or 0.25 in friction coefficient and compare that to any vehicle with wheels, it's a crazy high number. Um, and that's kind of my starting point when I, when I started Candela, what can be done in terms of electrification of boats? And uh, then uh, what do you need to do to, to deal with this, uh, uh, this massive need of energy to push uh, a boat forward? Um, so, so this was kind of uh, my initial conclusion. At the time I had a uh, a very nice uh, American uh, day cruiser, a Bertram 25. It's, um, it's um, uh, 25 feet and uh, that boat consumed 15 times more fuel per kilometer than my car did. Um, so uh, with that realization, the whole concept of doing this electrical didn't look very nice. Um, especially if you look into uh, the uh, energy density of batteries and compare it to gasoline. So uh, you need 15 times more per kilometer, but per kilo, you get 15 times less uh, if you go with batteries. So uh, some of you are pretty good in mathematics and you end up with this equation. Um, so this is kind of the initial or the starting point if you want to build an electrical boat of this size. Um, you need 15 times more energy and you get 15 times less energy. So uh, um, it's, it's not a, it's not a good starting point, really. Um, 
But as you might expect, sort of this was then the solution that we found. Um, and the core concept around Candela, I'm gonna cover that a bit more obviously uh, later on, but, it, but it's really to make it light. And that counts for half of the uh, drag reduction uh, and then to use hydropods. And that's kind of um, another half. So we end up with some 75. Now we are pretty much at 80% in, in drag reduction compared to, uh, to a planing boat. So it's really a fascinating um, use of physics here um, that is just too good to not use. Um, to give you a bit of background to, to the company, um, as mentioned in the introduction, I, I don't have any real um, boating um, history. I've not been in the trade uh, before. Um, I've been uh, sailing a bit and uh, I had this uh, motorboat, but not sort of a big boat there really. Um, my motivation was very much to, to get something very difficult to do. So I looked for a, for a, a, a sort of a, a large intellectual challenge while trying to do something good for the world at the same time. So, uh, and uh, I realized soon that nobody had been crazy enough to try to, to build an electric hydrofoil boat before. Uh, and typically when you look into new ideas, and you Google it, you see that this idea is super old and, and there are already a lot of teams that are on the way to, to uh, make it happen. But in this case, surprisingly enough, uh, there was nothing around at the time. Um, my problem though was that I didn't have any money to kick this off and I realized that we'd need quite a lot of money to make it happen. Um, so the next step, when that took like five months, I spent basically only on fundraising. Uh, I contacted some 90 venture capital companies um, I got two meetings out of these uh, 90 uh, contacts and I got two no's uh, in those <laughs> two meetings. Um, so it was not a, a very sort of strong start, um, but we are, were, I looked for some publicity. So we did some renderings and then we got some publicity in a, in a sort of small web magazine in Sweden. And then there was a, a pretty uh, almost more crazy than me guy uh, Christopher on the board that decided to to uh, get on board and, and and try to to make this happen and uh, so he provided the initial funds to make this um, come true um, and and then we could start to build the first prototype we put that in water in in June of 2016 uh, as Harry knows well uh, it didn't fly <laughs> that was the only problem with that boat well, it was actually not the only problem but that was the main problem uh, it did not fly. Um, the, and, and we had many issues with it. I think uh, one of the key issues was that we, we, uh, we got a lot of ventilation issues. So uh, that was probably the first uh, um, deep dive into, into hydrodynamics to understand what, what is really going on when it comes to, to ventilation. Um, then um, the other main issue we had was around the whole transmission. We, we built our own uh, Beevil gear. Um, and, and to make that work properly uh, was, was, a, was a tough challenge. So, um, but somewhere around at the beginning of 2017, we were flying for the first time. Uh, it, was a, it was a big moment, I can tell you that, especially after all these struggles we had. Um, and, um, and then we built a second prototype and then last summer, so some 18 months ago, we shipped the first boat to, to the first customer. So we have tried to move uh, as quickly as we can. Um, right now we have shipped 18 boats. Uh, we have sold some 28 boats, I think it is. Um, and, and we plan to, to build around 30 boats, um, uh, next year. Um, that's roughly what we have in the, in the budget. We also do quite a lot of developments for a new, a bit larger boat. Um, and, uh, we also move it into, and I'll come back to that later into public transportation uh, and, and passenger ferries. Um, so, but the, the core concept um, uh, is very much like, I would say the, the, um, uh, the flying flipper of, of Harry. Um, so um, essentially we're doing pretty much the same thing in that we go for uh, fully submerged to defaults. Um, we use, um, uh, pretty much the same type of sensors as ultrasonic sensors at this stage. Uh, we could uh, discuss that a bit more later, uh, what, what other alternatives there are. Um, and gyros and actometers and GPS, those are the core sensors we use. 
uh, quite a lot of computing power, not only for the uh, the core uh, control system, but also for all the safety systems that we had to build to make this to a con consumer product. And we have also developed our own uh, user interface and we have a, a separate screen for that and for all the data logging that we send into the cloud and so on. Um, and then we focused quite hard to make the, the boat light. So we use in uh, uh, carbon fibers and uh, we have a structure in the boat, which looks more like um, the way you build a Boeing than, than the way you build a boat. So it's a fairly dense uh, structure uh, and a fairly thin uh, uh, shell around that. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, you have, might have seen this boat before, um, but, but some comments on the, on the fault configuration. Um, so the, the setup we have is very much like a traffic airplane, if you like. So it's like 90% of the load in the front and 10% in the aft. So it's, uh, it's very stable in pitch. Um, and as you know, it's very unstable in roll and, and sort of in between stable and unstable in, in height. Um, the way we actuate the falls is that we actually move the legs back and forth. So around the, the Y axis. So uh, there are two hydraulic cylinders that sit inside the boat. And then um, the legs pivot around a point that is just inside the hull. Um, and by that, we twist the entire foil. So uh, one leg move forward, the other uh, leg move backwards, and then you get, you force the whole uh, wing to twist. Um, so, so that has been one of the major um, design challenges along with the other <laughs> challenges that we have to, to get the, this structurally uh, solid. Um, we need to have something that is very torsionally or easy to twist basically. So no, no torsional stiffness. Uh, and then we need a lot of uh, bending uh, stiffness, obviously. The, the foil is, um, is like, tw um, yeah, one inch basically in thickness. Uh, it's a 12% profile um, that we have developed ourselves, inspired um, by some of you guys online. Um, and then uh, um, in the aft, we, we control the pitch. Um, of the boat and, and we just do, do that by, by changing the rake of the rudder. Um, so a slow control there. Uh, the range of the boat is, is roughly 50 nautical miles. If you run 20 knots, 20 knots is pretty much the sweet spot for in terms of range. Um, the takeoff speed is depending a bit on, on load, obviously, but if you're only two people on board, you start to, to take off at six, six and a half meters per second. Um, so um, yeah. Um, yeah, so if, if, if you like mathematics, um, I think this is a very fun place to be in. Um, we uh, set out to model the whole boat in, in, in six degrees of freedom um, uh, to, to, um, to make as good a control system we could. Um, and another good thing with this is that you realize there are some other teams around now, but uh, to, 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 to this is kind of a way to to also keep the uh, competition at, at some distance because it is complicated. And this is one of the uh, of the very many areas I would say that are complicated in terms of engineering. So to get this whole thing together is probably the, the, the most challenging thing that you cannot only be good at one thing, you need to be into mechanics and mathematics and control system and electronics and software and so on. Um, yeah. Here are some pictures just showing sort of the degree of, of sort of internal work that we, that we have. So uh, we build uh, basically all the PCBAs ourselves. Those are internal uh, design. Uh, the two main boards we have is one is for the flight controller. We use a, a, a Cortex uh, controller. We run it at roughly hundred Hertz. Um, um, and um, uh, and we, we, we have a, uh, a um, uh, operating system uh, on it. We started off by just one single loop, but now we have several loops running in parallel and then we need a, a um, operating system for, for that. The, the other, uh, and, and the code is, is written in C. Um, the other main board is the uh, uh, user interface board, which is uh, a larger CPU since we, we deal with graphics, um, but with less requirements on on real-time computing. So um, 
there. It's a Python-based uh, code base uh, we're using for that. That board also takes care of all the data logging. We're logging some 280 variables right now. And uh, or whenever any boat that we have out there uh, is moving, uh, they send or they collect it at uh, 10 Hertz. So if anything goes wrong with them, we, we can just go through all the variables and see what's going on. That also means that we can do sort of pretty good remote service. We can even see what we're, uh, where the user is pointing at the touch screen. So if they're pushing the wrong button, we can guide them to, to push on the right button by seeing what they're doing in real time. Um, yeah, so, and, 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 and this, you see the, in the middle here, the, uh, that's the uh, uh, mobile phone app that we have for, for the end, end customers. So they can see charging status, uh, they can uh, um, change the, uh, the charging um, uh, current um, and, and turn on and off uh, uh, navigation lights and do some other stuff there. And, and obviously also check some of the last trip what was it in terms of length and speed and, and, and consumption. And up to the right, you see the, uh, the user interface I mentioned. Um, we did that from scratch as well. Um, it's uh, uh, the, the only thing we buy here is obviously the, the sharp data. Um, and then you see at the, at the right bottom there, that's the, uh, uh, the, uh, the lower unit, uh, which we, we had some issues to get right. Now it's working, but, but it was not easy. So if you uh, want to have troubles, uh, I can recommend you to, to build a super, from a dynamic perspective, very efficient lower unit, um, because then you, you have to challenge all the dimensions of the gears. Uh, and then you have to get all the tolerances and all the hardening and all the entire manufacturing process gets very challenging. Uh, so uh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is obvious for you guys. Uh, we are re reducing the the uh, the uh, resistance quite a lot. Um, um, you see here a comparison of some of the electrical boats that we have in the market right now, and we are talking about roughly eighty percent in uh, in reduction in terms of uh, kilowatt hours per nautical miles that we need to to run the boat in in decent speed, which is in our case between twenty or twenty five knots. Um, so the, um, the energy is, is one part, and that is obviously the thing that with the current state of art in batteries makes it possible to, to, to do a sort of a proper uh, uh, electric boat, meaning some both range and speed. Um, the other key thing is obviously the, um, uh, the behavior in, in big waves. Um, and um, I think that's where customers get surprised, um, along with the, the noise level, which is very low. Um, but, and that's something where we have put in a lot of effort to improve the whole wave handling. Um, um, and, and we are continuing to do so and, and looking into uh, other types of sensors to take that even further. Um, the key issue with uh, ultrasonic sensors are that first they are pretty expensive. Uh, they have very low sample rate. Um, and uh, I mean, I, you would like to have like three of them to have decent redundancy and to be able to say who's wrong and who's right. Um, so, so other types of sensors that are faster and with more redundancy uh, would definitely help a lot. Um, and then the wake generation is, is very small. Um, we have a very, uh, I mean, the Froden number on the, on the wing is, is, is high, which means that uh, there is basically nothing behind the boat you can see a bit increased there if you if it's heavily loaded, um, then you see, as you would expect, a bit bit of weight. But it's it's in the neighborhood of two inches roughly in in uh, weight height, and then it's very fun to run. And uh, I think that comes partly down to uh, uh, that it's um, the way we are able to deal with with uh, with turns. So we we have um, uh, fully coordinated turns um, as Harry has and have had for. Uh, 20 years probably. Um, and um, and the last thing we did there was to do the obvious thing, namely to add a, a, a sensor to the uh, to the steering wheel or to the rudder. So now we can use that input to to, to control the banking uh, before we used mainly the uh, the uh, gyro. So the yaw rate plus the uh, GPS course 
in a complementary filter. Now we use also the, um, the, the steering sensor, which um, makes the boat very sporty. So we can really, uh, whenever you, you turn it, um, it sort of kicks down directly uh, and gets into the turn uh, very fast, much faster than any normal boat. So now the turning radius is good and, and, and you can really get some G-force in, in the turns, um, which makes it fun. Um, right. Um, I mentioned briefly, uh, and, and this is fairly new for us, but um, it could be fun anyway to mention a few things about it. Um, we have gotten some interest, especially from the from the city of Stockholm, but now also from from two cities in in Norway and and some uh, cities down in in uh, uh, in the on the um, uh, yeah in, in Saudi Arabia and and. Uh, in the um, Emirate down there um, to look into this whole idea of doing the same stuff that we do today, but do the for in a bigger scale, so larger boats. Uh, so we started to look into that. And then we came to the conclusion when we looked into the boat or the passenger ferries in the archipelago of Stockholm that it would make sense while at it to also make them autonomous. So that's something we are uh, working on now. And if you do that, you can then go for a bit smaller boat size since you don't have the staff cost anymore. Um, and then it would make sense to make the whole thing on demand, meaning that you can skip timetables uh, and, uh, and, and let the, um, um, all the customers, um, the citizens of Stockholm decide sort of how the, the route should look like uh, and have a central computer for that. So um, it's super exciting, um, obviously, um, the whole autonomous, um, um, area is uh, is a uh, is a fascinating uh, piece of technology. Um, the car industry is um, is leading that, and uh, we can really piggyback from a lot of work that has been done in that area to to make it happen also on sea. And I think it's actually much easier to do it on water. So maybe uh, we could be uh, faster um, despite a much smaller budget than uh, what you see on land. Um, so this is a very early rendering, but it gives you kind of the idea what we're trying to do here. So um, it's a, uh, uh, a catamaran, catamaran uh, hull. Um, the main reason for that is to increase the, uh, the width of the boat uh, and still make it efficient. And, and as you know, you get a better aspect ratio if you do so. Uh, it's also obviously a safety thing to, to have a wide boat um, in the event you would get some ventilation or something would happen. It's, it's good to have a bit of width in the boat. Um, we equip it with two um, um, motors um, uh, in order to be able to um, navigate uh, autonomously in a harbor. So with, with um, uh, force vectoring you can, or, or thrust vectoring, you can get sort of wherever you want, uh, even in, in, in tough winds and so on. Yeah, I've talked a lot and you have been very uh, patient and silent. So <laughs> any any questions or comments on all this? Yeah. I've got a question. Yes, Gunter. Yeah, uh, I would like to know that seven meter boat is said to have a range of 50 nautical miles. Mm -hmm. but Battery capacity have you got in it? And how heavy is that battery? So we use the battery from BMW. It's a, it's a 40 kilowatt hour battery. Um, and we run at roughly 16 uh, kilowatts in, in 20 knots. So uh, if you do the maths there, it should add up to, to 50 uh, nautical miles. It's an engine 60 kilowatt. Uh, no, uh, we use uh, 16 kilowatts if we run 20 knots. Uh, the motor is, uh, it's uh, sort of continuous load is maximum at uh, 55 kilowatts. We can peak it a bit up to like 65 or something. Um, but that's really only needed for takeoff. Are these output engines from Torquedo or? The, yeah, the motor we buy currently from Torquedo, yes. So it's mm -hmm. the same, they have, I think they call it Torquedo 80. So it's 80 horsepower, um, 55 kilowatt. Um, so it's the same motor um, and we get the battery from them as well. 
um, the, the invalid How much battery. does the battery weigh by itself? Um, including cooling, uh, it's uh, close to 300 kilos. Uh, we also need a sort of a dampening system um, for it. So, so that makes it fairly heavy. So, but roughly yeah. 300 kilos all in all. Okay. So the engine was, you'd say 16 kilowatt. Well, the max power is uh, 55. Um, the uh, consumption or the power needed at 20 knots is 16. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, yeah. <laughs> but then when you go in real waves somewhere uh, like on the sea, what will happen? Can you still control the boat with uh, yeah. good waves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have some videos uh, on uh, our website showing when we run in fairly uh, big waves. Uh, I think we have a base wind in that case of 15 meters per second and um, and, and the waves are fairly big. But, but I mean, obviously, the, I think the issue from a, from a, since this is a consumer product, what we really need to train the drivers on is that um, the boat may work very well in big waves and, and, and also when they encounter big wakes. But the problem is if they rely on that every time and then they have some kids and 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 and, and wives on board uh and then all of a sudden you ventilate the fall it, you will get at least surprised um and you also get a bit wet when that happens so it's important to sort of communicate that to the driver that they uh, realize that there are limits here and compared to a planing boat if you run in big waves you, you really feel it um it's slamming a lot so uh and, and it's continuously slamming. Here, it's more of a sudden event, um, which can surprise people and make them afraid. So uh, I think that's that's a sort of a major challenge, or the, the biggest challenge, I think, in, in sort of uh, communicating this. Um, but so far, it has worked fine. But it's important that we stress that topic. Mm -hmm. So I think running uh, in, in moderate waves, say up to like half a meter, which is more than it sounds, um, then this boat is much nicer to run. But then you hit the limit where you can't go uh, anymore in in falling mood. Um, but I live, I have a summer house out in the archipelago in Stockholm, and it can be fairly rough. It's it's pretty far out, and uh, when it's like say 15 meters per second in wind, all the planing boats they they run very slowly, like uh, eight knots or something, and I can run 25 knots. Um, but then when it gets up to 20 meters per second, I they they can run faster than I can. <laughs> Who has the next to, question? Uh, if you have to go, uh, fl uh, float about uh, in very bad ways on the hull, then the hull is not very well formed to take waves. Huh? No, correct. And, and that's actually something we have uh, noticed as well. Uh, so, and something we are dealing with now in the next boat model, that we, which also means that we need to change the center of gravity a bit. Um, now, as I mentioned, we have 90% of the load on the front foil, um, which means that the center of gravity is pretty much in the middle of the boat. Um, a planing boat, ideally you have the center of gravity roughly 35 or 33% from the aft. Oh, so yeah. uh, to make it good in planing, you have to make those two center of gravities to meet, uh, which means you meet, need to move around the foils. Um, or the battery or something else to, do, to make that happen. Yeah. And the whole weight was 1,3 tons, you say? Uh, well, the, the entire boat with everything in it, it's 1.3 uh, tons, yeah. So there's the people on this? Uh, no people on it, no. Oh, so that comes extra? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Next and, question. And this, mm -hmm. oh, in this book, we, we can run with, the maximum we have done is, is 10 people on board. It's not enough seating for it, but it's it's possible. So, yeah. It's astonishing. There's another next question, Ray. Oh, Martin, Martin Graham. You're muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
Uh, Gustav, uh, you mentioned earlier on about the control system and that the, the rear foil is a more slowly varying um, incidence angle. Um, and so presumably it's the front foil that's doing all the dynamic control, but is the rear foil then just to, to do a low frequency adjustment of the height of the boat? Or could you explain that a bit further? Yeah, so um, it's basically just a normal uh, controller where the uh, input is the, uh, the, the pitch angle as measured from accelerometers <laughs> and, and gyros. Uh, and then in order not to get interference, we just make that system slow. Um, okay. But we have, we have no, we started off, I mean, talking control system, we started off with an approach where we, um, we had a, um, uh, we, we controlled the, um, the angle of attack. Um, um, and uh, Harry came up with the idea that, and I think, are you online, Harry? I think you're muted, Harry. It says I'm not, but uh, uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think the, the idea came actually from Harry, and I think the, the story was that uh, he, Harry had a, um, a, uh, a, a an angle of attack sensor, um, and that sensor broke, and then the idea came up why why look after the, the um, angle of attack at all? Um, at the end of the day, you want to control the, the roll and, the, and the, uh, the pitch and the height, and, and you can just sort of push that straight into the control system. So, so that's what we do now. Um, we, we, uh, we use control, in our case, it's hydraulic. So we, we control how much the valve is open um, based on uh, the input variables, which is then the uh, the, uh, the positions and the velocities and the accelerations. Another question? I have one. Um, in an aircraft flight control system, 75 to 80% of the software uh, is dealing with the redundancy management and providing a, a, a high availability uh, infrastructure for the control laws, which only make up about 20 to 25 percent of the software. Uh, could you talk about your redundancy and redundancy management and what sort of safety requirements that you have for the control system on this boat? Right. I, I think, uh, I mean, a, a good starting point is that we fly pretty low, as you say, compared to uh, to a Boeing, so so that helps. That's a starting point, um, and so and we can always sort of go down. Um, uh, so, so that is basically the the uh, the main sort of emergency event. So if 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 things are wrong, then then we just take down the boat um, by um, setting the RPM of the of the propeller to zero, and and then um, uh, just just ramping down the height. So, so that's the key thing there. Uh, then, uh, yeah, so this whole safety and redundancy topic, it's, it's obviously a fairly complex topic, but, but starting with the, uh, with the sensors, um, it, I mentioned we have two uh, ultrasonic sensors. Um, so we compare them uh, and if they disagree for more than 0.2 seconds, we, we take down the boat. Um, and, uh, and then we have three, all the IMUs, uh, gyros and actometers, we have three of them. Um, so there we can, uh, we can say if anybody is wrong and we don't have to, to act on that until um, there is um, not two of them agreeing. Um, now we have found that those IMUs, they basically never break. So that's not, has not really been an event. Um, and then uh, in terms of actuation, um, we use hydraulics. The key thing there is to monitor the pressure. Um, we have an accumulator tank. Um, so we have a bit of reserve uh, pressure or flow in the event that the pump would stop. Um, so uh, we, we check that all the time. And, and if the, the pressure drops uh, below a certain threshold, we use the remaining um, that we have left to just just go down uh, 
we also that's not really um, safety related, but we also have to allocate the flow. If you're running very rough C, all the actuators want to use all the flow, so you have to to allocate that, and then we give priority obviously to the to the front files. But we also have to um, reduce the flow in the event that the the uh, pressure drops too much. Uh, then in software, um, we 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 use a, um, a uh, an operative system um, that is, if you like, sort of controlling different uh, paths in the software. So it's it's kind of monitoring that the things are doing what they should and, and that they uh, report back within a certain time frame. Um, and if that doesn't happen, typically we can restart a, a, uh, 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 a software loop. Uh, and if that doesn't work, you you have to to go down again so uh, um, that's the main strategy for for uh, for that um, so but we have very rarely seen um, I mean the main issues for us and in terms of sort of to get this right has been around the the pressure topic um, the other and then the ultrasonics obviously especially if you run in in, in rough sea and, and if it's raining and they get wet and all of that um, initially, one of them could just start to report a very low value. And then if you take the average of that, then you start to push the boat upwards, which is a bad idea. So, um, but it's, so it's a combination of sort of a, um, um, a, a structured systematic uh, uh, approach to this. And then at the end, you need to just go out and have a lot of hours uh, uh, on C to see what works and doesn't work. Next question, Harry. First of all, it's good to meet you. First time I have. Uh, and uh, second, secondly, could you characterize your customers? Yeah, uh, I think it's fairly easy actually. Um, and I think that partly goes to the, to the uh, topic of, of, I mean, the boat is fairly expensive right now. Uh, we are working on that, but um, that, that sort of, uh, uh, sets the target group a bit. Um, most of them are entrepreneurs themselves, meaning they have made some money and uh, they probably are a bit of a risk takers as well. So they are um, into new products and, and, and can take the risk that uh, what that means. Um, they're all male. Uh, they are all above 40 years old uh, and they own at least one Tesla. I don't think we have any customers that have known a Tesla. <laughs> so typically they come from that sort of electrification angle and you probably know some Tesla owners. It can be almost like a, like a religion, uh, and and some of them are almost a bit fanatic. So it's like having a dinner with them. Um, sometimes you you have to change subject and, and talk to talk about <laughs> politics or something easier, um, but in order to avoid conflicts. Thank you. How much is the price for the boat which are built in series? Uh, Two hundred and ninety-five thousand uh, dollars. Two hundred ninety-five thousand dollars. Yeah, that's uh, quite some money. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> absolutely. And and but it's also yeah. I mean, we don't make much money on this right now, and the the company is still loss making. So uh, it's. Um, um, I think the the focus of the design so far has been very much to make it work. Uh, and the next generation boat will be uh, to obviously make it work. We also have quite a few uh, things that will increase the range of it. Uh, but most importantly is to bring down the, the cost of production so that we can can spread this to a, to a greater audience. But because it's, it's only then that we have any meaningful impact on the environment. Um, now it's too, too expensive and therefore the volumes are too small to to claim that we do anything good there. The question. Very expensive by torpedo, the motor and the battery. Uh, what was that? Uh, are the battery and the motor which come from uh, torpedo, are they very expensive? Uh, yeah. Um, and I, I think that's, that's a key problem for all the pleasure boats that are electric today that they don't get really access to um, to the uh, uh, battery pricing 
of the uh, car market. Uh, the, the pricing for cars is much, much lower than any uh, boat manufacturer can, can get. Uh, I mean, we're talking a quarter roughly of the price uh, in the car industry compared to what you see in the, in the boat industry. So we are working on, on that to try to find solution to it because to, again, to, to, to make this technology spread and really scale, then uh, we, we need to address the topic uh, in, in a serious fashion. But it's a, it's a concern today. Another comment, a question? I have a question. Sure, Roger. Uh, first of all, congratulations on so much uh, really excellent work. I really admire everything you've done. Um, Thank you. The um, battery technology is obviously improving uh, fairly rapidly. Did, did you make any um, overt uh, design effort to accommodate future improvements in, in battery um, performance? Uh, do you mean if that would sort of alter the, the way we build the boat or? Uh... Well, I mean, is it capable of higher speeds, for instance, if, uh, you know, the battery technology allowed it? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the next boat, we, we are planning to, to um, I mean, first of all, the, the efficiency is gonna be higher. so. With, with roughly 25% less uh, capacity uh, and thereby weight, we, we, we will reach the same range. Uh, and then we will offer um, uh, double that capacity and then we get double the range of the current boat. So then we're talking um, in, 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 in US miles, we're talking 110 miles um, or 100 nautical miles. So, um, uh, so, so I think sort of that then the, the range is not really a, an issue anymore. Um, I think the key for us is really the, the price of batteries that they come down um, and, and that will help really to spread the, the technology. Um, to make the batteries lighter will help, but, um, and, and we can use that saving in weight to, to use uh, less expensive materials, meaning less fiber instead of carbon. So mm -hmm. I think those are probably the things we're gonna see. Um, then I sometimes get the question, and maybe that was not really what you asked, but what if the batteries will get, say, five times more dense than they are today? Uh, is there a market for hydrofoil boats then? And uh, I, I think there is. And I, I think the key reasons for that is that it's a much nicer boating experience. Um, you get less slamming. And also, if you take away the noise of a combustion engine motor, um, you realize that the hull is making a lot of noise in a a normal planing boat, um, and uh, uh, in a hydrofoil boat, you can you can get rid of that noise as well. So what you have left, and that's something we deal with as well, is the transmission noise. Um, if you kill that, you have a fully silent boat. Um, when it comes to speed, and to your topic on that, um, we um, it, it's mainly a safety topic. Um, if you put this in the hands of um, uh, normal customers, which means that some are going to be a bit crazy, um, then um, we cannot see that they use it in a way where, where they hurt themselves because that's bad for them and it's going to be bad for us. So therefore, we are a bit conservative in, in terms of increasing the speed. The top speed now is 30 knots. Um, we, we could easily go up to 40 knots if we want. Um, we have in tests run around 35 knots. Um, so, but we, we limit it in, in the software today to, to 30 knots. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, just last week, um, Volvo announced that they were gonna cease production of their uh, seven marine outboard engines. These are the mm -hmm. largest outboard marine uh, engines in the world. They're based on a Corvette uh, internal combustion engine. And, you know, apparently Volvo is making a very concerted effort to go uh, go green with all their marine products. I was just wondering whether you'd had any discussions with them or uh, you see any potential there? Yeah, I mean, we, we have had uh, quite a lot of discussions with Volvo Penta. What, what I think we have seen so far from them is that they have had very limited R&D into, into electrification. So they've been super slow on that topic. Um, I also had uh, a few... Uh, a month ago, um, have discussions with the, the world, the largest boat builder in the world, 
who happens to be an American uh, group. Um, and, and apparently they are also super, super slow and late into the whole electrification topic. So um, I, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know why they did that move right now. I, I uh, In terms of Volvo, I, I thought it was super strange when they bought that company. It was not very many years ago that they did that. I think right. they got some panic because all of the, uh, um, all, all of the motors nowadays are basically output motors and there's a big trend in, the, in that direction. But, um, yeah. and now they realize they have to deal with the environment as well. So they, they lost a lot of money in that direction that they could have spent on uh, developing new technology. And uh, I mean, they, they have been invited to fund us, for example, but they, uh, they didn't do that, um, which um, I don't know if they regret it, but um, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 need, they need to speed up, I think, which all the, which the entire industry needs to do. And I think uh, talking about the industry, I think uh, a problem for the industry is the fact that uh, it's, it's, it's a very fragmented market. If you go to the boat show in Düsseldorf, for example, uh, the number of brands you find there is probably a hundred times what you find in a normal car show. Uh, although the market is at best, a hundredth of the of the size, right. so uh, and then tr and and so nobody is making money, um, and then try to fit in some R and D budget into that no making money, uh, being a very small manufacturer. So I think that's a huge challenge uh, for the industry. So um, and then it's good for us that there are some investors that are willing to bet on this that we can develop this technology initially with a loss, um, and 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 try to to um, uh, to do something new here, um, but it's also a bit surprising that a company like us can can do uh, something that feels so new uh, in this industry. Thanks again. Did you ever try to uh, build a hull uh, on a rip basis to get uh, lighter and safer? Uh, to get to build a hull out of what? Rip. A rib with uh, tubes, you know, inflatable tubes, rib. Oh, a rib. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would certainly be a, a, an option. Um, um, yeah. So, but on the other end, I mean, the, the, uh, if you take the, the current hull, if you just take the outer shell of the hull, that is, uh, for us now, it's 105 kilos. And then the structure is like 90 kilos. And then the deck is another 90 kilos. So, with all the glue and lamination to, to put that together, we are at like 300 kilos in total. Um, so there is not much gains to be made there. It's all the other equipment where we have to reduce the, the, the mass. Um, and, and that's something we are working on now to do. So um, I think we've probably actually increased the, the mass of the, uh, of the boat as such without any equipment in it in order to reduce the cost. Um, so, but rib, certainly, I mean, if you would do a, um, if you would do a, uh, an efficient planing boat uh, to make it electric, uh, the, the best choice would be a, uh, a rib with a, with a carbon hull. And I think it's hard to make it lighter than that. Um, and, and then you can have, if you have some steps in the hull, so you, you reduce the, uh, um, the friction, the um, uh, then uh, by 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 pushing some air under the hull, um, then you can get decent um, decent uh, lift drag ratio, um, maybe of factor six or something. And uh, are your foils painted? What was that? The foils are they painted or are they metallic surface? Uh, no, they're all built in carbon, um, and. Uh, we are, yeah, so, so and, and we put paint into the mold. So yes, they are painted. Um, we are doing some experiments now with um, using um, Teflon in various forms to, uh, to make nothing stick on them. Um, and, and there is um, already available, there's Teflon film. Uh, it's like a foil that you can just put on to any surface. And, and, and then nothing grows on it. So it's a pretty, pretty good product. So um, that's, you if you have growth that, problems, buy that and put it on the entire house. Uh, mm. But you could use Intersleek 900. 
that reduces the friction also in the foils. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, or maybe, yeah, we have tried a lot of different paints, um, but none has been really good. I mean, uh, obviously the, the bleeding ones, they, they get a rough surface after a while and, and that increases the, uh, the drag. Um, and the non-bleeding ones, they are not very good in terms of anti-fouling normally. Um, the ideal solution, except for, um, for Teflon, I think would be to, to put copper on the whole foil, um, but that's not allowed. So we don't do that. I would like to follow up with a question. You talked before, uh, just a short while back about um, a rib being a good starting point for, um, for a boat. What, what um, hull forms did you look at before you settled on the one? I like what you have, but what other, what variations did you look at before choosing this? Well, well uh, when I, I wanted to build an electrical boat, it was basically uh, that rib boat that I sort of we discussed. That was one alternative. And then it was this type of design. And, and uh, I mean, we, we uh, in terms of lift, drag, lift uh, drag rates here, we are at like 15 right now. Um, and uh, with, with uh, that type of rib, you can get to, to maybe uh, six, I guess. So it's still a, a, a pretty large difference there. Plus, um, it's more fun to be the Hildefoy bolt, so. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Do we have more? Oh, Ray, I think you're muted. You're muted, Ray. Got it. How's that? Good. Gustav, here's the question. Uh, could you compare yourself with sea bubble on a couple of levels uh, number one as you advance do you think you'll be making boats that are capable of carrying passengers on a taxi service and the second question would be do you see some promise in their technology where they're using converting uh they're converting water into hydrogen and oxygen and then uh, using that to create electricity, and that's their energy source. Um, yeah, I mean, on the first topic, yes, we are actually venturing into passenger transport now, and, and our first boat going to be a boat with taking 12 passengers. So, and, and that is uh, due to regulations, uh, it's kind of the, uh, uh, the, the, the passenger uh, size uh, that has the, the, the least regulation, if you like. So. Uh, we stay there uh, with the first boat. So in, in that sense, we would become a competitor of, of sea bubbles. Um, the hydrogen topic, I, I think it's it's difficult. There's a lot of R&D going on into that direction now, and a lot of investments taking place. Um, and, and maybe saying the obvious things about hydrogen, but I think two challenges you need to overcome there. Uh, the first one is around the whole distribution of it, which seems to be fairly complicated since you you want to have roughly uh, 700 bars uh, of pressure uh, and to build up that infrastructure uh, with is it, not easy, um, which means it's always going to be difficult. You, you can make it happen probably in a, uh, for cars where, where you have much more volume uh, and then you can set up an infrastructure for that. But even that's gonna be complicated because you need to coordinate between countries. Uh, so in Europe, you would have to put that on European level, which means it's gonna take a lot of time. Um, and then in the boating sector, uh, I, I can't really see when uh, in the near future that could really happen. The other challenge or the second challenge with hydrogen um, is, uh, is the, the, the pretty bad uh, energy efficiency. So you, you lose roughly, um, uh, 60 percent um, uh, in in the conversion first from electricity to hydrogen and then and then back. Um, so I think that type of technology it's the, the advantages with hydrogen is obviously that it's super energy dense. Uh, so uh, it's much better than than batteries uh, uh, at the state that batteries are today and and probably they're always going to be better. Um, but um, so, so that would mean for me, I think what where where hydrogen would make sense is in aviation, where um, you need high energy density because you cannot carry around a lot of uh, 
mass in a in a traffic airplane um, and then probably also in in global shipping so big cargo ships where they have very long routes and they stay out for weeks um, and, and there is no possibility to charge anywhere but if you talk about the city um, and the public transportation system then you have short uh, routes uh, you're going to be able to charge like everywhere uh, and range really is not a big topic then anymore uh, if you go for induction charging, for example, where you have just a plate um, in the harbor and a plate on your boat, and, and it's like a, um, yeah, th then, then uh, that could be done whenever you stop. And, uh, and, the, uh, and you, nowadays you can charge batteries pretty fast. So, so I don't really see the point in that. I, I, I've been surprised before about the, the technology routes that they have taken, but yeah, I, I wish them all luck. I mean, there is, there is a good need for it. For, for many companies in this industry. Good answer, thank you. Just another question. That's uh, safety in case of accidents. I mean, in general for electric uh, propulsion, isn't that dangerous that they are high voltage and seawater can kill the people around when they are floating in the water? Yeah, I think, um, well, the, the the, it, if you look at just sort of the, the um, yeah, in a scenario where maybe you, you, you crash the boat and, uh, and then you no. get kind of electricity out in the water or something, there would be, if, if people are swimming in that water, uh, you, they will not feel anything because uh, the, um, it's going to ground itself, so to say. So you're going to, the, the, the electrons will go the shortest way, which will be where it's shorted. Um, so, so that's not really a, a tough scenario, I think. But um, if if the battery explodes, uh, that is that is probably the the, uh, the really tough scenario, which is the same as for cars. Uh, it it could happen. Um, it doesn't seem to be super likely if you look in the car industry right now. Um, one advantage that we have probably is that uh, if if you if you crash the boat so badly that the, the, the battery gets wet. And I mean, we have ingress protection, obviously, in the battery pack as such. Um, then I think the whole boat will sink. Um, and um, the battery is built in a way that it should take uh, one meter of depth before you get water floating into it. So the pack should then be one meter below the surface. Then you get water into it. And then it was, then you can get a thermal runaway. But but then it's at sort of safe distance, I think, and they have a lot of cooling water around it. So, um, but sure, it's a risk. Um, I think it's a higher risk. You see a lot of, um, or a, a lot of um, uh, boats where the uh, uh, where they have a the 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 tube from the uh, fuel tank to the motor uh, is typically done in rubber, and and that can degrade over time. And then you get fuel into the the whole motor compartment uh, in a in a boat, and, and therefore you see every year that boats explode uh, with combustion engines. So I think that's still going to be more likely than than battery explosions, but um, it's it's not risk free. I think that it's it's eleven o'clock. We um, here, and um, I think we could take one more question. I, I've got a quick question. Does anyone question. have one? Yes. Um, when you talk about your autonomous operation for the ferry, um, how are you planning to handle the issue of collision avoidance? Right. Um, so, yeah, we, we're looking into different sensors. So we're going to have uh, mainly video and, and, um, and radar uh, as the main sensor types. Um, and then you need to, when, whatever image you get in, you need to convert that into objects. So you need to, to find objects in, uh, in your image. Um, and there, there are a lot of uh, sort of standardized open source softwares available to do that. So, so that is a very sort of advanced area already we, where we don't have to invent very much. Does it um, work in waves? Pardon? How about waves? Does yeah. these software, you, you know, if they're developed for land-based operation, I can see that in a sea state, 
that could be a real problem because they'd be seeing waves as moving objects. Oh, I see. No, that hasn't been a problem so far. Um, no, so so that that works fine actually. Um, okay. So so the object detection piece is is up and running for us. Um, and then what you do then is from those um, objects that you have in your found in your picture, you need to estimate the uh, the velocities of these objects in a uh, yeah obviously in a in a polar uh, polar coordinate system. Um, and and the way we then deal with that data is that if you if you think first in a in a two dimensional space, uh, there you have water and land from your seek chart. So if you make that just black and white, and white is water. Um, then you need to add your objects to that, which become points uh, on that 2D surface. And then you need to um, uh, make an assessment or a, 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 a projection of where will these objects be in the future? Uh, and if you add time then to your plane, the X, Y, and then time, then these points become like cones, uh, if, if you're following me. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all the islands or whatever land you have, those just become sort of extruded parts that go straight up into that right. wood of then cylinders and, and upside down cones. Um, and, and then you just apply a, a fairly standard type of, of uh, root optimization algorithm to that. Um, there is one called A star. I think it was. Uh, done by i think it was nasa that started with that back in in 58 or something uh so it, it's basically just finding the shortest way from one point to another and then they have a lot of ob obstacles in the way and, and if you do that in this three-dimensional space um then you kind of have it so <laughs> that's the that's the sort of simplified description of this now you have thousands of bad cases here uh, to deal with. But, but the basics is not very complicated from a mathematical point of view. Mm -hmm. Cut it off, but I think this has been an extraordinarily good Q&A session. Um, Gustav, you have been exceptional in your willingness to answer every question and your um, ability to answer every question. It's been a very, very good session. We greatly appreciate uh, you're, uh, you're joining in our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. And again, I mean, I'm, I'm most grateful for it. And then I got very much direct help from Harry Larson um, when we started to develop the, uh, the control system. So uh, it's really a, a joint effort with uh, a lot of you guys involved.